In this video, we introduce three fundamental chemical laws that are pervasive throughout chemistry. The first law is the law of mass conservation, which was discovered by uh, Lavoisier in the 18th century. Okay, so Lavoisier was uh, trying to do uh, oxidation or combustion experiments. He actually uh, uh, was the discoverer of uh, oxygen. And the uh, combustion experiments are like this. You can have a chamber, Okay, uh, uh, which may have this shape or any other shape, and then the oxidation reactions are always a uh, substance that we call a fuel, and then oxygen. Okay, and this fuel uh, is a molecule that can be oxidized. It can have various forms. It can be a sugar, it can be a uh, 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 hydrocarbon, it can be a fat, it can be uh, anything that you want that can be oxidized. Okay, then you run this reaction, and this reaction generates a variety of products, which we will talk about later on. Uh, anyways, the important finding is that uh, the mass at the start of the reaction and the mass after the reaction has finished was always the same. And this was not one observation, it was a collection of observations. So I was very carefully changed the amount of fuel, the type of fuel, the reaction conditions, and still uh, the mass never changed from reagents to products. Okay, so that uh, collection of observations uh, is what we call a law, and that is the law of mass conservation. Okay, so that is the first uh, fundamental chemical law that we review here. The second one uh, uh, is the law of definite proportions. Okay? So uh, this is a law by uh, Joseph Bruce at the turn of the uh, 19th century, 18th to the 19th century. Okay, what Proust observed is that uh, when you have a compound, whatever it might be, so let's take a simple one like water, H2O, okay? This compound might come from various sources. Okay, so you can get, uh, you can go to a, a lake and get a sample of water, get to a different river or a separate river, uh, take a sample of that water, go to the ocean, get a sample of that water, then you clean that water so that uh, you don't have any impurities, you just have pure water. And then uh, what you can do then is try to uh, do an elemental analysis of that compound. Try to figure out what the mass of all of the elements in that compound is. And uh, what Proust found is that for all different samples, okay, regardless of where they came from, uh, for a molecule like water, if you get a mass or a, a sample mass of 18 grams, okay, it turns out that, uh, again, if this is 18 grams, for all of the samples, the mass of hydrogen and the mass of oxygen, those masses never change. This is about 2 grams and this is about 16 grams. And this applies not only to water, but it applies to any compound that you, uh, that you can think of. Okay, uh, calcium carbonate, calcite, a very, uh, a very pervasive mineral. Okay, it's always the same for any company you can think of. Okay, this is the law of definite proportions. Now, uh, this law was important because uh, it made people start thinking uh, that perhaps uh, a way to explain this, right? So a theory to explain this was that uh, elements are formed by uh, tiny little particles, which uh, they call atoms. Okay, that are indivisible. Right, so the idea that you always have these, uh, these mass combinations is because those atoms, those individual tiny little particles, always combine with each other uh, in the same way. Okay, and that would be a way to explain this law of uh, definite proportions. Okay, so uh, from here, Dalton took over and uh, he made another uh, a set of observations uh, to come up with the law of multiple proportions. Okay, so what is the law of multiple proportions? Uh, the law of multiple proportions uh, requires consideration of uh, uh, two or more uh, different compounds uh, between the same atoms. Okay, so let's take, for example, uh, carbon and oxygen. Okay, so carbon and oxygen can combine to form various compounds among themselves. Okay, so, so the idea here is that uh, what you can do is try to analyze the mass uh, uh, ratios of oxygen to uh, a given amount of carbon and there's a, a law that appears that is uh, uh, very interesting. Okay, so again, the idea is that we're going to take uh, various uh, compounds of carbon and oxygen, and we don't know exactly what the formulas are. Okay, they didn't know at the time what the formulas were, right? But you can do an elemental uh, mass analysis. Okay, so the idea here is that you're going to take carbon, you're always going to get one gram. Okay, so uh, we're going to focus now on two compounds of carbon and oxygen and see what happens to those masses. Okay, so if you take one gram of carbon, and then you take uh, oxygen and change the mass to, uh, or an analyze the mass of oxygen in the first atom, in the first compound, it turns out that the mass is 1.33 to 1. 
that is of no importance. What is important is that if you now go to the second compound, okay, it turns out that uh, the ratio or, or the mass that you get is 266 to 1. Okay, and again, these are two different compounds, we don't know what they are yet. Okay, now this is important because it turns out that the ratio of these masses actually can always be reduced to uh, uh, very small whole numbers. Like you, you take the ratio of 2.66 to 1.33 grams, and that happens to be 2 to 1. Okay, and again, this happens for any compound, any series of compounds uh, formed by two or more elements. Okay, you always have these uh, whole numbers. Right, and what that actually tells you is that it, it, it appeals to the concept of the atoms, right? The idea is that, well, that's, if that's the case, what this is telling me is that in these two different compounds, okay, have that in this compound I'm going to have twice as many atoms uh, of oxygen as I do in this one. Okay, so that is very important because, again, it reinforces the concept that uh, uh, matter is composed of atoms, right? So uh, the question is, well, what are those, those compounds? Well, in principle, uh, we actually don't know what those compounds could be. For example, they could be CO and CO2, okay? That would actually agree uh, with this uh, found masses, but it could also be CO2 and CO4. That could also, uh, uh, that also agrees with uh, these experimental observations. Or it could be C2O uh, o and C2O2 and so forth. Okay, so, well, of course we know that uh, those experiments that Dalton were performing when you get this, experiment, uh, this data are actually for these two uh, compounds, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. Okay, the rest of the uh, compounds do not exist. Uh, okay, so it can, it can be any, any, uh, any other compounds, but we actually don't know exactly what uh, uh, the combinations are only from this experiment. We actually need to introduce the concept of uh, atomic mass and so forth to actually unequivocally determine whether the two compounds that we have are these two or those two or those two. All right, so in this video we have introduced three uh, fundamental chemical laws, the law of conservation of mass, the law of definite proportions, and the law of multiple proportions, which again uh, underlie uh, uh, all of chemistry. Okay, in the next video we're going to be talking about uh, Dalton's atomic theory, which actually stems from uh, uh, this last law.